I called this election because as we faced the start of the crucial Brexit negotiations in just a few short days, I believed it would be essential for the British government to be in the strongest possible position going into those talks. That remains the most critical issue in this campaign. But of course, when this campaign started, we could never have predicted the tragic turn that events would take. We could never have imagined the appalling depravity that led a cowardly and callous killer to target innocent men, women and children in the way that we saw in Manchester two weeks ago. Nor could we have envisaged the brutal attack that was carried out on the streets of London on Saturday evening. We continue to hold all those affected by both attacks in our thoughts today. And let us also continue to think of the brave men and women of the police and the emergency services who continue to deal with the aftermath, many of whom will have witnessed things that no one should ever have to see. But while it was right that we should pause to show our respects to those we have lost and to ensure all our energies were focused on responding to the immediate aftermath of those events, it is also right that our way of life and our democratic process should go on. That is why today I want to return to the choice people face in three days' time and to the crucial question of leadership, because that's what this election is about. It's about which leader and which team people trust to take the big decisions that matter to Britain. About which leader and which team people trust to keep Britain safe. About which leader and which team will deliver economic security for you and your family. And about which leader and which team will travel to Brussels in two weeks and negotiate the right deal for Britain in Europe. Because the question of leadership has always been at the heart of this campaign. And it is absolutely crucial that we get the answer right. The ability to say the courageous thing and do the difficult thing. To face up to and address great challenges, not to pretend they don't exist or seek to wish them away. The strength to be straight with people and not just tell them what they want to hear. The ability to get the job done. That is what leadership means to me. And it is that leadership that I offer the British people at this election. Strong and stable leadership to guide Britain through the years ahead. And we need that strong leadership now more than ever. For in just two weeks, we embark on perhaps the most difficult set of international negotiation this country has ever known. The most difficult and the most important. Because everything we want as a country depends on getting these negotiations right our future prosperity, our place in the world, our standard of living, and the opportunities we want for our children and our children's children. Each and every one depends on having the strongest possible hand as we enter those negotiations in order to get the best Brexit deal for families across this country. If we fail, the consequences for Britain and for the economic security of ordinary working people will be dire. If we succeed, the opportunities ahead of us are great. I have negotiated for Britain in Europe, and I know that the best place to start is to be clear about where you stand and what you want. That's why I've been clear that we do not seek to fudge this issue, to be half in and half out of the EU. The British people made their choice, and it would be a scandal to do anything other than respect their decision. And it is right to respect the view of other European leaders, also when they say we can't be half in, half out of the European Union either. So we will leave the European Union and take control of our money, take control of our borders and take control of our laws. Our money, so we no longer pay huge sums to the European Union every year, but spend that money on our priorities here at home. Things like the new shared prosperity fund we will put in place to reduce the inequalities that exist within and between the four nations of our United Kingdom. Our borders. So while we continue to attract the brightest and the best to work or study in this country, we can be confident that we have control over immigration and that our immigration system serves the national interest. Our laws. So we bring the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice to an end and return decision-making authority to this country as the public demanded we should. 
And as we deliver on the will of the British people, we will forge a new deep and special partnership with Europe, allowing us to trade and cooperate with our nearest neighbours. But we will also reach out beyond Europe to strike new trade deals for our goods and services with old allies and new friends around the world too. This is a clear and ambitious plan that I'm confident we can deliver. That is because we have taken the time to develop the plan, to study the detail, to understand the negotiating positions and priorities of those on the other side of the table, to build the relationships and to be absolutely clear in our own minds and in those of the 27 remaining member states about the kind of future relationship we seek. Now compare that to the alternative. We know a little of what Jeremy Corbyn would do. He openly says he would throw all of our work away on day one by scrapping our white paper without having any idea what he would put in place instead. He says he wants tariff-free access to the EU, but cannot say if he wants to remain a member of the single market and with it remain subject to the rulings of the European Court and to European free movement rules. He cannot say if it means remaining a full member of the customs union, which would deprive us of our ability to strike new trade agreements around the world. These are the most basic questions that need to be answered, and yet we've heard nothing at all about them from Jeremy Corbyn. But we do know something that Jeremy Corbyn says he would do on day one. He would throw away our negotiating position at a stroke by rejecting the very idea of walking away with no deal. Now, I often say no deal is better than a bad deal because that is in Britain's national interest. Jeremy Corbyn seems to think that any deal, no matter what the price, no matter what the terms, is better than no deal. That's not leadership. That's an abdication of leadership. The bureaucrats in Brussels would think Christmas had come early if the British government adopted such an approach. Yet that is exactly what Jeremy Corbyn is proposing. And that's why he's not fit to negotiate a good Brexit deal for Britain. Yet on the success of that endeavour, everything else depends. If we get Brexit right, then together we can do great things. We can build a Britain beyond Brexit that is stronger, fairer and more prosperous than it is today. And that's what my plan for a stronger Britain is all about. Fulfilling the promise of Brexit so that everyone in every community can enjoy the opportunity and security that they deserve, the opportunity and security they need. That means economic security, and it means physical security too. The Conservative Party has always understood that a strong economy is the foundation for everything else. If we are to have the prosperity, security and quality of life that we want, we must first ensure we have an economy that is robust. This belief in sound money and fiscal credibility is in the core of our DNA as a party. And as we face up to the challenge of leaving the European Union, it is even more important today. We hold true to it because we know that if you cannot manage your money properly, investment will dry up, <coughs> taxes will rise and businesses and the jobs they provide will flee from our shores. And it's ordinary working people who will pay the price. We hold true to it today because we know it's jobs and investment that provide the money we need to fund the vital public services on which we all rely. And above all, we know that it is wrong to pass to future generations a bill you cannot or will not pay yourself. Because every pound the government borrows falls to others, those who come later, including people not yet born, to pay back. If we're serious about restoring the contract between the generations, there is no more important thing we can do than seek to balance the books and pay down the debt. That is a simple matter of justice that only the Conservative Party understands. So we will show leadership and continue to take the difficult decisions we need to bring the deficit down. Ten years after the banking crisis, and thanks to the hard work and sacrifice of people across the country, the deficit is back to where it was before Labour let it spiral out of control. And thanks to our careful stewardship of the economy, debt is about to start falling too. So the government I lead will carry on with the job, getting the country back to living within its means, because a strong economy is the basis of our security as a nation. But that is not the limit of my ambition. 
it was right that we should take the difficult decisions over the past seven years to get the deficit under control. But the government I lead will do more. I'm determined that the next Conservative government will focus on growth and on driving growth across the country to build an economy that works for everyone. And that is how we will fulfil the promise of Brexit together. We will encourage businesses to set up and grow by cutting corporation tax to the lowest rate in any developed economy. Because Conservatives know that's how you raise more money and attract more investment. Punishing businesses with higher taxes is not leadership, it's an abdication of leadership. A good soundbite for an election, but a disastrous policy for our country. And punishing families with higher taxes is not leadership either. Yet that's exactly what Jeremy Corbyn's plan with the independent, uh, Jeremy Corbyn plans, with the Independent Institute's fiscal pol studies, saying his policies will cause the highest tax burden ever known in Britain's peacetime history. And that's not our way. We will keep taxes low. And we will do new trade deals for Britain's goods and services with new friends and old allies around the world, because trade will be crucial to our future growth and prosperity. We need to be a great global trading nation once again. That's why we will create a network of trade commissioners across nine regions to lead export promotion, investment and trade policy overseas. And like all Conservative governments before us, we will bear down on regulations wherever we can and continue to regulate more effectively. But while a strong economy is the foundation, a fairer economy is vital too. That's why I want to do more to spread prosperity and opportunity around the country, as our new modern industrial strategy will do. It means keeping taxes low and helping people with the cost of living by intervening where markets are failing, by making markets work for working people. And it means guaranteeing a decent wage for all with a higher national living wage, and not just protecting, but enhancing rights and protections for people at work as we leave the EU. And with a strong and a fair economy, we will invest in our vital public services, give people dignity and security in old age with annual increases in the state pension, and invest in keeping our country safe. Retaining Trident, increasing the defence budget, and backing the finest police and intelligence services anywhere in the world. For keeping our country safe should be the number one priority for any Prime Minister and any government. Yet in this election, there is one leader who has made it his life's ambition to get rid of Trident, and one who is committed to keeping it. One leader who has boasted about opposing every single counter-terror law, and one who has been responsible for passing them. One leader who has opposed the use of shoot to kill, and given cover to the IRA when they bombed and shot our citizens, and who now, in the midst of an election campaign, wants to do all he can to hide or deny those views. That's not leadership, it's an abdication of leadership. It's a failure to meet even the minimum requirement of the job of Prime Minister to keep our country safe. Safeguarding the security of our country takes leadership. That's why since 2010, in the face of a growing threat, we protected the budget for counter-terrorism policing and increased the resources available to the security and intelligence agencies. It's why since 2015, when Jeremy Corbyn's front bench was arguing for the police to be cut by a further 10%, we've not cut the police, but protected their budget. It's why we've increased the number of armed police officers, improved cooperation between the police and specialist military units, and provided funding for an additional 1,900 officers at MI5, MI6 and GCHQ. Yet despite the progress we have made in recent years, and the successes we've enjoyed, we must do more to respond to the changing threat to our country and our way of life. We cannot deny that the threat from Islamist extremism is one of the gravest we face. I believe it is right that the UK is engaged in taking on and defeating groups like ISIS and their like around the world. It is in our own national interest to do so, and it is in the interest of the wider world. But as our efforts to defeat them overseas are ever more successful, they are increasingly seeking to spread their poisonous ideology 
and to prey on the weak and vulnerable in our own countries, inspiring them to commit acts of terror here at home. They exploit the safe spaces of the internet and social media, and they exploit them in the real world too. The UK has led the world in developing a strategy for preventing violent extremism, and it has been highly successful. And we are leading international efforts to take on and defeat the ideology of Islamist extremism around the world. But as the threat evolves, our response must do so too. We cannot go on as we are, enough is enough. We must do more, much more, to take on and defeat the evil ideology of Islamist extremism that preaches hatred, sows division, and promotes sectarianism. It is an ideology that promotes a false choice between our Western values of freedom, democracy, and human rights, and the religion of Islam. It is a perversion of Islam and a perversion of the truth. And it will only be defeated when people understand that our values, pluralistic British values, are superior to anything offered by the preachers and supporters of hate. We must deny it the safe spaces it needs to take root and grow. Working with other democratic governments, we will agree ways to regulate cyberspace and prevent the spread of extremism and terrorist planning online. We will continue to support military action to destroy ISIS in Iraq and Syria. And we will do more to deny this ideology the physical space to breed here at home. That means refusing to tolerate extremism of any kind in our country. It means being more robust in identifying it and stamping it out across the public sector and across wider society. This is what we must do if we are to come together as a country and tackle this extremism in our midst. Not just violent extremism, but the whole spectrum of extremism, starting with the bigotry and hatred that can so often turn to violence too. And as I said yesterday in response to the attack on our country, the third in as many months, because of the changing nature of the threat we face, we need to review our counter-terrorism strategy to make sure the police and security services have all the powers they need. If that means increasing the length of custodial sentences for terrorism-related offences, even apparently less serious offences, that is what we will do. These proposals, set out in our manifesto, are founding, founded on a deep understanding of the threat we face. They may be uncomfortable for some to contemplate, but nothing is more important than keeping our country safe. That is what strong leadership is about. Stepping up, facing up, and doing what's right for Britain. That is and will always be my approach. I just want to do what's best for our country, to get on with the job in front of me, and to lead Britain forward. A year ago, I launched my campaign for the leadership of the Conservative Party in this very room. I said at the time that I'm not a showy politician. I don't tour the television studios. I don't gossip about people over lunch. I don't go drinking in Parliament's bars. I don't often wear my heart on my sleeve. And that's true. But I said then and I say now that if ever there was a time for a Prime Minister who is ready and able to do the job from day one, this is it because there's no time for learning on the job. The demands of the role are significant, the ability to master the details crucial, and the need to make big, important decisions inescapable. And with the Brexit negotiations, beginning just 11 days after polling day, we have no time to waste. So I offer myself as Prime Minister once more, with a resolute determination to get on with the job of delivering Brexit, Confidence that I can get a deal that works for all. And belief that I have the vision, the plan, the will and the experience to fulfil the promise of Brexit and build a better Britain. That is what the election in three days' time is about. It's about who can provide the leadership to do what's right for Britain. And with the support of people across the country at the ballot box on Thursday, that's what I will do. Thank you.
I can take some questions from the media. Who do we, uh, who do we have here? Um, goodness me, it's a whole host of, uh, whole host of media. Gary. Um, this morning, Cressida Dick said that in the light of the attack over the weekend, absolutely we need to look at having more police, more forensics, more intelligence officers. Do you agree, and would that mean you were wrong to cut numbers? Well, Cressida Dick has said that the Metropolitan Police are well resourced, and they are. She said they have very powerful counterterrorism capabilities, and they do. We have protected counter-terrorism policing budgets. We've funded an uplift in the number of armed police officers. And uh, from 2015, as I said in my speech, we're protecting police budgets. And that is despite the fact that Jeremy Corbyn's front bench suggested that police budgets should be cut by up to 10%. But it's also about the powers that you give to the police. And I've been responsible for giving the police extra powers to deal with terrorism. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn has boasted that he has opposed those powers and opposed the powers for anti-terror uh, action throughout his time in Parliament. And I also support absolutely uh, shoot to kill. And I think what we saw on our streets on Saturday was how important that was. Those police officers, within eight minutes, had shot the three attackers and killed them, and that saved countless lives. Uh, and the next question. <laughs> Beth. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, uh, a question on those police cuts. You talked today about stamping out extremism in communities and preventing uh, young people becoming radicalised. But isn't it a fact that 20,000 police cuts has meant that there have been cuts to neighbourhood policing, cuts to community policing, cuts in exactly the place where you need to stop this ideology growing? Uh, was this raised while you were Home Secretary as a problem and what are you going to do about it? Thank you. Well, it is absolutely right. I've set out in my speech today that I do think we need to take a much more robust approach to dealing with extremism in this country. I think there has overall, we've made progress on this. I introduced a counter-extremism strategy when I was Home Secretary. Uh, but uh, I think we have seen overall too much uh, tolerance of extremism in our society. So we do need to deal with it. That's why uh, in our manifesto we've set out uh, a step that I think we'll be the first country in the world to take, which is to uh, introduce the Commission on Countering Extremism. That will be working with the public sector, but also with civil society, with organisations and individuals, both to promote our pluralistic British values, but also to help people identify an extremism and be able to know how to deal with that extremism when they see it. That's the first time any country has taken that step. I believe that's important, and I believe that will help us in that necessary task of stamping out extremism. <coughs> Andy. Thank you very much. Andy Bell, uh, Five News. Prime Minister, you accused those who were concerned about police cuts of crying wolf. Do you accept now that you were wrong to say that, that they were raising legitimate concerns? And do you commit to restore those 20,000 police officers that were cut since 2010? I have answered uh, the question about uh, policing, but I'm very happy to repeat what we have been doing in policing, which is we have been protecting counter-terrorism policing. Uh, we provided funding for an uplift in armed policing. We have, uh, from 2015, we're protecting police budgets. As I said, the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn's front bench, said that police budgets could be cut by up to 10%. We said, no, we're going to protect those budgets. But it's also about the powers that you give to the police. And I have been responsible through a number of pieces of legislation I've introduced to give uh, extra powers to the police to deal with terrorism. Jeremy Corbyn's boasted that he's opposed every single piece of anti-terror legislation since he came into Parliament. And Laura. Um, Prime Minister, the most direct experience that members of the public see in terms of efforts of the government to keep us safe is the number of police on the streets. On your watch as Home Secretary, the number of armed police officers fell. It's still lower than it was in 2010. The number of officers fell in total by 20,000, as we've been hearing. And also control orders that monitored terrorists were watered down. Now, if you mean what you say this morning, that this election should be about leadership and it's your number one priority to keep the public safe, 
Would it not be leadership to say that you would reverse those cuts? You mentioned uh, the control orders there, Laura. Of course, the control orders were being knocked down in the court. Uh, and that's why we looked at, had to look at the issue of uh, control orders, but ensured that the police and security services had powers in their uh, remit to be able to deal with people who would do us harm. And that's what we've done. We have enhanced the powers for the police. We've in, uh, ensured that the security and intelligence agencies have the powers that they need through the Investigatory Powers Act that I introduced when I was Home Secretary. And that's what this is about. It's ensuring that our police and security services are able to do the job that we want them to do. We've protected those counter-terrorism policing budgets. Uh, as I say, we are funding an uplift of, uh, I think it's 1,500 armed police officers. But it's not just about resource, it's about the powers people have. And as I said earlier on in response to a question, you know, I fully support the police in Shoot to Kill, and we saw on Saturday night how important it was for them to be able to act on our streets to protect British citizens. Uh, Nick. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, you've said that the time has come to tackle uh, not just violent extremism, but extremist ideology. Does that mean that you've changed your mind? Because you'll remember that you had a very public row with Michael Gove in 2014 when he said that you and your officials were prepared to tackle uh, violent extremism, but not extremist ideology. So are you are now agreeing with what Michael Gove said then, which is that you need to drain the swamp and not simply beat back the crocodiles from the boat? Well, I've been very, very clear throughout, actually, that it wasn't just about uh, violent extremism. It was about extremism. And that's why, when I was Home Secretary, we introduced the counter-extremism strategy. You can look back, I've made various uh, speeches over the years where I have said that we do need to deal with extremism, not just the violent extremism. But what we've now seen is a change in the threat that we face, an increased diversity in the threat that we face. And I think it is important for us to respond to that, and that's what you would expect a government to do. And as I said, while we've made progress in relation to extremism, I believe that there has overall been too great a willingness to tolerate extremism in our society, and that's why we need to take further action. Um, uh, yes, Chris. Chris Hope, Telegraph. Prime Minister, do you, I know you blame the courts for getting rid of control orders in 2011 when you were Home Secretary, but why not bring them back, and do you regret getting rid of them so, so soon? No, as I say, the control orders were being increasingly knocked down by the courts. We introduced the terrorism prevention and uh, investigation measures. We enhanced those measures uh, most recently to ensure that the police and security services have the powers they need. We've also given the police additional powers in a variety of ways. For example, the ability to take somebody's passport away temporarily at the border, to then, uh, uh, if they think they're leaving the country, to uh, perhaps to go to fight in Syria, for example, uh, and if they to see if they can prosecute that individual. We have consistently looked at ensuring that people have the powers they need. We need to do that. We need to continue to do that as we see a different threat. And that's what I'm committed to do. Uh, ben. Um, you talked about protecting the counter-terrorism policing budget. Um, but what about the neighbourhood policing budget? You oversaw huge cuts to that. Those are the officers on the ground, the eyes and ears to generate intelligence. Was it a mistake to cut thousands of those? We are, we are protecting police budgets. As I say, uh, what we saw in 2015 was the Labour Party front bench under Jeremy Corbyn's uh, leadership saying that they would be happy to see uh, police cuts, that they thought it was possible to have police cuts of 5 to 10%. We said no, we're protecting those budgets. Harry. Thank you, Prime Minister. Uh, Harry Cole from The Sun. Um, overnight around the world, we saw a slew of headlines that would suggest that Britain is reeling and London is under siege, which is not an image that many communities are recon recognised this morning. What's your message to those that say Britain is cowering in the face of terror? No, I think that what we have seen from the British people is that resolute British spirit and resolute British determination to get on with life and show that business is as usual. We saw that following the Manchester attack, uh, and we saw it, and we're seeing it today in London. As you say, people here in the UK are going about their business because we will not allow the terrorists to defeat us. We will defeat them. George. 
Chris Parker from the Financial Times Prime Minister. I wonder if you'd like to say anything at all about the way that Sadiq Khan, the London mayor, has handled this crisis and whether you have any views on the interventions of uh, foreign world leaders in this issue uh, so soon after an attack. I think, I think Sadiq is doing an excellent job. And uh, Sadiq has, uh, I've chaired a second COBRA meeting this morning. Sadiq Khan has been present at that, was present at that meeting. He was present at the COBRA that I chaired yesterday. Uh, and we're working together. We're working with the Mayor of London and with City Hall to ensure, for example, that the transport network has been able to, is able to get back up and running so that people can go about their business. Um, Michael Sutton from the Herald. Um, by and large, this election south of the border has been about Brexit, but north of the border it's been largely about independence. Nicola Sturgeon believes she has a double mandate to demand from you on the vote independence referendum. She got most seats and most votes in the 2016 Holyrood election, and she had a clear mandate from the Scottish Parliament. Uh, the Scottish voters would like to know a precise answer to this question. Can you tell us what the precise reason is that you believe she does not have a mandate? I've been very clear that now is not the time to be talking about a second independence referendum in Scotland. Uh, first of all, we are going into these Brexit negotiations as the United Kingdom. Now is the time we need to work together, not be trying to pull ourselves apart, as Nicola Sturgeon is. Uh, I would remind everybody that in 2014, it was the Scottish Nationalists who said that vote was a once-in-a-generation, indeed once-in-a-lifetime vote, and that vote was to stay part of the United Kingdom. And finally, I would say to everybody, anybody who believes in our precious union, anybody who believes that we are four nations but at heart one people, that we should stay together as the United Kingdom, should vote Conservative. Yes. Prime Minister Carl Dimon from ITV News. Um, we have now had three terrorist attacks in three months. Whether it's an issue with policing or whether warnings have been missed, do you regard these attacks as a, a failure to prevent the attacks by government? And if so, do you worry about what that says about your record? Well, over the past three months, we have had the three attacks. The police and the security services have also foiled five other attacks. What we have seen is an increase in tempo and a, a change in the terrorist threat, as I said, with terrorism uh, uh, breeding terrorism. And that's why it's absolutely right that we look at our response to that and we adjust our response, as we always do when we see the terrorist uh, threat evolving and the means of the terrorists evolving. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Matthew Holhouse, MLX News Agency. Uh, Prime Minister, you and your government want to stay party to uh, counter-terrorism proposals, counter-terrorism tools after Brexit that are operated by the European Union, such as the Schengen Information System, this EAW. Um, but as you know, those are currently subject to the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. So do you accept that if you want to keep hold of those tools, you're going to have to compromise on your objective of exiting the European Court of Justice, or do you have an alternative plan that would allow you to do both? The uh, Schengen Information System, as you say, it's, it's not just about terrorism, of course. It's about serious and organised criminals as well. It's about identification of people who are travelling across borders. And uh, as part of the negotiations, we will be looking at that and at various other uh, programmes and projects and, and uh, 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 arrangements of cooperation that we have currently as a member of the European Union, which would lapse if we, when we leave the European Union, and to continue to have those in future. There'll be a number of areas in those negotiations where the, currently the European Court of Justice has jurisdiction, and as part of the negotiations, we will need to be looking at how we can ensure that there is appropriate oversight of the use of, use of those, but I'm very clear the European Court of Justice uh, and its jurisdiction in the UK is going to be ended. Uh, yes. Jason Gross in the Daily Mail. Um, last night, Jeremy Corbyn said uh, he would consider any request for new powers from the security services. Um, I wonder what you made of that pledge and whether you could match it. And uh, can I ask you also uh, about uh, revelations overnight that one of the killers uh, in the latest attack appears to have featured in a Channel 4 documentary last year waving an ISIS flag in a London park. When you say we've been too tolerant, is that the sort of thing you mean? Well, first of all, the uh, police have now identified all three of the attackers, and 
as and when progress in the invest investigation allows, they will release those names. So I can't comment on the, uh, on the individuals, uh, and it is, of course, still an ongoing investigation. As to Jeremy Corbyn's uh, claim that he would consider any powers that the uh, security services ask uh, to have for the future, I would simply say to people, look at the different records. As Home Secretary, I increased powers available to the police and the security service to deal with terrorism. Jeremy Corbyn has boasted that he has opposed every single piece of anti-terror legislation since he came into Parliament. I think that's all people need to know. Yes, Rob. Rob Hutton from Bloomberg. You just praised the work that uh, Sadiq Khan has been doing as mayor. Um, Donald Trump uh, responded to the attack by mocking Sadiq Khan. Uh, would a period of silence on his part now be welcome? <laughs> I, as I said, I'm very, clear that Sadiq, I'm very clear that Sadiq is doing a good job as mayor of London. We're working with him, working together, and that's important. Government, central government, and the London mayoralty and uh, his officials working together to ensure that we are responding to the attack and uh, looking, as I've said earlier, at the work that the police is doing to give the public extra protection and extra reassurance. We want people to go about their business. We are very clear that we will not allow the terrorists to harm our way of life or to harm our democracy. Now, who else is, uh, there's somebody at the back that I can't see, sorry. William James from Reuters. Um, you've talked a lot about the, uh, the reasons why you've called this election. I wonder if you could just tell us uh, how many seats do you need to win to justify that decision? I have, uh, throughout my many years in politics, I've always been very clear. I never set expectations of that sort and I never predict election results. What I do is go out and campaign to earn the trust and support of the British people. Uh, Tork McCrichton, Daily Record. Prime Minister... Why did you tell police officers they were crying wolf when they warned you about cuts? Well, I think you're referring to a speech I gave to the Police Federation where I was very clear with the Police Federation that they needed to reform. And guess what? The Police Federation took that message and they're reforming. Yes. Prime Minister, uh, Adam Bianco from Business Insider. You've said this election is about leadership. Your own leadership has been called into question this morning by your former colleague, Steve Hilton, Director of Strategy under David Cameron, who said that you were responsible for these recent attacks. Um, what is your response to him? I think, I have to say, um, I don't think I'm the only person in Westminster who has found themselves on the receiving end of a few comments from Steve Hilton. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Alex Spence from BuzzFeed. Um, what would Donald Trump have to say for you to criticise him publicly? <laughs> oh, well, I've been very clear. I've been very happy to say that I think President Trump is wrong to have taken America out of the climate change agreement, out of the Paris Agreement. Uh, the United Kingdom stays in it, and we believe it's an important international agreement. So I'm not afraid to say that I think President Trump is getting things wrong. Uh, there was one Did further hand. Did you Sadiq Khan is doing a good job. I've said that. I think Sadiq Khan is doing a good job, and uh, it's wrong to say anything else. He is doing a good job. Yeah. Um, Prime Minister, you've got strong and stable written um, on your lectern there. Um, does that stability apply to your top team, or can we expect a sweeping reshuffle on June the 9th? <laughs> <laughs> You're not the first person who's tried that, I have to say. Uh, but I will put on record that I am proud of my cabinet, I'm proud of the work that they've done. I think they've done an excellent job since the election. They and I will be spending the next few days focusing on the thing that matters to the British people, which is ensuring that we have the right leadership and the right government in uh, power after the election on June the 8th. It's a very simple choice between strong and stable leadership with me and my team or a coalition of chaos under Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you. <laughs>